Hear the word of the Lord from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 21. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no gods, other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Peace be with you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Dodds. I'm one of the pastors here. Really good to be with you this morning. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? You and you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. These are God's words to Israel through the prophet Isaiah, and they fit well with our text today. The last two weeks, we have sort of walked into a new sermon series and concentrating on the Ten Commandments. And so for the next number of weeks, we will be looking every week at a different commandment. Interestingly, our scripture doesn't use the phrase Ten Commandments. It's actually recorded in Exodus as Yahweh's Ten Words. And so today we're considering the first word. And today we will consider in our text the polytheistic context of the text, what idolatry is and where it is, and how the first word is for God's church. The, the ten words begin with a bit of narrative. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And, and this summary of the Exodus is attached specifically to the first commandment. Because the, the reason why God wants Israel to serve and worship him only and have no other gods before him is because he is the one who brought them out of Egypt. He is the one who brought them out of slavery. It's the rationale that the Lord gives for all the commandments that he gives Israel. It's because he's the God who rescued them from Egypt that they are to bear his name faithfully. It's because the Lord brought them out of slavery that they should avoid murder and theft and adultery. 
Their entire corporate life is meant to express the fact that they have been brought out of Egypt and out of slavery. This is a narrative of liberation. The Lord has brought his people out of slavery and into freedom. But when we look at the contents of the ten words, we might be tempted to think that God is playing a trick on Israel. He says he brought them out of Egypt to freedom, but then when they get to Sinai, he only tells them what they can't do. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this other thing. All these do nots. Exodus means freedom. But with all these prohibitions, isn't Sinai just a new form of slavery? No. And I'll tell you why. In the context of the entire Bible and in the context of ancient religion, the first word is not a word of enslavement, but a declaration of independence, a word of liberation and a way of living in freedom. The world of Exodus 20 is a polytheistic world. So what was it like to be surrounded by hundreds of gods? What was it like to serve hundreds of gods and to satisfy all of their commands and desires? You couldn't possibly do it. If you satisfy Diana, Jupiter gets jealous. If you're worshiping Baal, you'll upset Molech, and he might seek revenge. The gods of the ancient world were also not faithful gods. They were fickle, changeable, unpredictable, and they took delight in tripping up and enslaving humans. And to live in a world of many gods... To be faced with this many gods was essentially to live in a constant state of fear. Where do I stand with all of these gods? That's not a world of freedom. That's a world of slavery. Now, the scriptures tell us that Israel did worship Egypt's gods while they were in Egypt. At the end of Joshua's life, in Joshua 24, he gives this speech as he's dying, reminding Israel that before Abraham, they used to serve false gods in Ur. And they served false gods when they were in Egypt. And so this helps us to see that the plagues were designed not only to punish Egyptians, but also to wean Israel away from idols and give them freedom from the tyranny of all of these insatiable gods. Now, let's let's talk about idols for a moment. The Bible describes idols, false gods, as lifeless. In Psalm 115, the psalmist describes them like this. They have eyes, but not sight. They have mouths, but they can't speak. They have noses, but they can't smell. They have ears, but they can't hear. They have hands, but they can't feel. And they have feet, but they're lame. They can't walk. And the psalmist goes on to say this, so shall they be who worship them. So God's word promises us promises humanity something profound. If you worship idols, you will become like them. So if your idol is dead and you serve a dead thing, then it's killing you. The Bible promises that it's killing us. See, the Lord doesn't just rescue Israel from idols and slavery. He rescues them from killing themselves. He rescues them from certain death. The first word is a command to walk in freedom before the one God of all creation. It's a call away from death in dead idols to resurrection life in the one God. And Israel probably needed that. 
They still had Egyptians among them at Sinai. It's slightly speculative, but there were probably idols being worshipped among them on the mountain. We know that eventually one big idol, the golden calf, will be made shortly after the commandments are, are given. So Israel needs this commandment. So, talked a little bit about the polytheistic culture. Let's move into our second point. Really, the big question this morning is, sure, Israel needed that commandment, but do we need this commandment? Now, I don't suppose that any of you have a a Baal shrine in your basement or that many of you are invoking Dionysus every morning. I don't don't suppose. Could could be happening. I don't know if it is. If it is, talk to me later. Um, But even though that may not be happening, we are still prone to idolatry. We are still enslaved to many idols that plague us. Even here today, we are still very much polytheists, trying frantically to satisfy all the different gods and all the different demands that they make on us. And since that is the case, we can look a little bit more carefully at what this first word says. Thou shalt have no other gods before my face. That's the, that's the Hebrew translation, the literal Hebrew translation. So it's not before me as if it's a ranking, but before my face, in front of me. What does it mean for an idol to be before the face of God? Well, the most literal violation of this commandment would, would be to bring an image of a false god and set it inside the temple. And the life of Israel... In the life of Israel, some kings are going to do that. Manasseh, the king of Judah, famously puts an idol right inside the temple before the face of God. I mean, he, he deliberately violates this commandment. But of course, this doesn't mean that the Israelites were free to worship idols elsewhere. It wasn't as though they could hide their idols. I mean, according to Psalm 94, Yahweh made the eye. He can see things that are even hidden. But regardless, the Old Testament does talk about idols of the heart, idols that we carry inside of us. In Ezekiel 14, God warns the prophet Ezekiel that their elders who are consulting with him and pretending as though they want to hear the word of God, are actually carrying idols in their hearts, and the Lord calls them to repent from their idolatry and to turn away from their idols. See, our our heart idols go wherever we go. We have an idol in our hearts and we go into the temple, even if we say that we're worshiping the Lord, we've brought an idol before the face of God. And it's not as though that picture or warning is softened in the New Testament. Where is the face of God in the church? Where is the temple of the living God? Where does the Holy Spirit dwell? He dwells among us. The living temple is here. This is where he dwells. And if we set up idols in our hearts, if we cherish idols in our hearts, if we serve idols in our hearts, then we have put idols before the face of God just as surely as Manasseh did. And I I know that perhaps we'll say, well, I I don't think that we do that, do we? We don't worship false gods in our hearts. Well, what does it mean to worship and serve the one God? I mean, it seems like a simple question, but it's a good one. Martin Luther said that to keep this first word is to love and serve the one God above all other things, to love him, to trust him above all others. Isaiah says, the Lord 
is your judge. The Lord is your Savior. The Lord is your lawgiver. So to the extent that we are looking for approval, to the extent that we're looking for approval from anyone or to anyone but the Lord, we serve an idol. We are setting up another as judge. To the, to the degree that we're looking for someone else or looking to someone else for salvation, for blessing and for abundant life, we are setting up another as Savior. And to the extent that we listen and obey any voice that is not the voice of the Lord, we are setting up another lawgiver. Judge, Savior, lawgiver. So let's, let's take a moment just to sort of sit before the Lord together and consider this. Who is your judge? Whose evaluation of you matters to you most? Whose assessment of you really determines how you are going to behave? Whose opinion of you do you worry about? Is it your friends, your coworkers, a supervisor, family members, one of your parents? Maybe a hypercritical parent or an absent one. Is it your spouse? Is it one of your children? Is it a sibling? Through whose eyes do you fear being considered not enough, not needed, unwanted? To the degree that you've made these your judges, you're going to be tossed to and fro just, just as much as an ancient polytheist. The Pharisees, Jesus says, prayed, fasted, and gave alms, but for what reason? To, to gain respect and approval of others. Not from the God who they pretended to pray to, but from the people around them. So who is your judge? Whose disapproval do you fear? And I wouldn't try to answer this right away. I think it, it takes time to consider this and think. I mean, good answers aren't necessarily always immediate. Good answers sometimes take time to get to. But talk with fellow saints. Talk and wonder and think out loud together. Confess and honor each other's confession. Pray for one another. If you're, if you're not looking to the Lord as your judge, you've only set up an idol. You've not only set up an idol or a set of idols, but you're in. You're enslaved. You can't satisfy all of these judges or keep up with their demands. There's just no way that we can do that. With so many idols that we do set up, there are contradictory demands that will always kind of keep us jumping from one foot to the other. And keep us very busy. So what does the Lord say to us here? He says, put away the idols. Remember that the Lord is your judge. Trust his approval. Keep the first word. Have you ever thought, if I just had a little more money, if I just had a little higher income, a little bit more recognition, a little more ease, a little more time, a little more comfort, then I, then I would be happy. Everything would be easy or easier. My life would be fine or better or rich or whole. And I would be satisfied if I just had a little bit more. Who are you looking to for blessing? A future inheritance from a family member and a new promotion maybe. 
Have, have you become so good at saving that no job loss, no downturn in the market, no bad financial decision could ever affect you? Jesus says you can't serve two masters. You can only serve God or mammon, but not both. They have different demands. Plus, you can't satisfy mammon anyway. It's like trying to satisfy greed. Greed is never satisfied. Money is never satisfied. And that's what makes it slavery. Here's the truth if we're just honest with ourselves. Depending upon what we love, we will never have enough. The way that Solomon puts it is, he who loves money never never has money enough. But we can take that word out and replace it with other things. Whoever loves comfort never has enough comfort. Whoever loves security never has enough of it. Whoever loves control never has enough of it. See, we're never going to be satisfied with idols. There's always going to be more to get, more to earn, more stuff to buy. And in those ways, we'll never be satisfied, but we'll also be enslaved to tyrants who keep demanding more. That's what, that's what idols do. They promise everything, they deliver nothing, and they demand everything. They promise everything, they deliver nothing, and they demand everything. They have a voice that echoes the enemies, if you remember from the garden. Every idol says, if you're faithful to me, you will be like God, and you shall not surely die. If you have enough respect, you will be like God. And gosh, people who have a ton of respect, they can live forever. If you have enough love or peace or success or comfort or control, you will be like God and you will not die if you have those things. That's what idols say. But in this respect, we must be idol shatterers. We must remember that God is our savior, that Jesus comes to save, idols come to enslave. Keep the first word. What happens when you get cornered? What happens when you get criticized? Do you, do you admit and confess your sin? Or have you at different times made someone else your sin bearer? Have you ever loaded your wrongs onto someone else's back? Your spouse, your friend, your coworker challenges you, and instead of confessing your sin, you, you blame them. Maybe you say, well, the reason I do that is because of what you do. You make them your sin bearer. But see, Jesus is the sin bearer for all of us. Not your spouse, not your parents, not your children, not your friends, not your coworkers, not your job, not society. Jesus alone bears sins. Maybe you pile up sins on yourself. You make yourself your own sin bearer. You bear your own shame. I get that because I do that. But doing this will only crush us. It will only kill us because we can't bear our own sins. And personally, I don't recommend it. So don't try. Remember that Jesus is your sin bearer. Trust in him and keep the first word. Whose voice is in your head? What is telling you, 
What is it telling you to do or to believe? Who is the real Lord in your head? Whose voice are you really listening to amongst the din of voices? If there's some other voice that drowns out or cancels out or challenges the voice from Sinai, the voice from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' voice, then you can be sure that it is the voice of another lawgiver. And you need to remember the first word, the word that was from the beginning, the Lord, your lawgiver. See, the first word is a declaration of freedom. Paul says there is one God and one Lord, Jesus Christ. So what we have been freed from is this. In Christ, we don't have to worry about other judges or seeking the help of other saviors or listening to other lawgivers. We have one Lord who speaks an authoritative, loving, wise and freeing word for all people in all places. We only have to listen to one voice. And in a world filled with thousands of conflicting voices and millions of insatiable demands, this is a great relief. This yoke is light. Under the direction of his voice, our lives can be coherent and free, but only as much as we are entrusting ourselves to him alone and keeping this first word, remembering that the Lord alone is our judge, the Lord alone is our savior, the Lord alone is our lawgiver. Our society is currently priding itself on having freed the public world from all signs of deity. In the empty public square where no God stands to direct us, absolutely everything is welcome and tolerable. And we think, or we're tempted to think, that this makes us more free. But in the one, in the one God's world, Things and people aren't free to do or to be anything that they please. They're free when they become what they are. An acorn is completely free to become an oak. It's not free to become an elephant. The ten words guide God's people to become what they are, sons and daughters who host and rule in their father's house. But don't be fooled, there are gods in public life even though we can't necessarily see them in statues and and they are jealous gods. The Romans were very tolerant. When they conquered peoples, they didn't wipe out their gods, they actually adopted them. There's some evidence even that they, they may have made the same offers to Christians We'll leave you alone. We'll even give Jesus a statue in the Pantheon. Jesus can be one, one of the many gods of Rome. See, Rome is a very tolerant people. But what they couldn't tolerate were a group of people who refused to worship the many gods and only truly worshiped the one God and kept his first word. Our world today prides itself on tolerance, but it's, it's not more tolerant to our devotion to the one God that, that it, it's not more tolerant to that than Rome was. And if we are truly devoted to the one God, truly keeping the first word, we must know that we will be at enmity with the gods of this world. We're going to be on a collision course with the God of sexual freedom and the God of success, and the God of social media, and the God of security and safety. We're going to clash with the gods of our world, not just because the first word is a command, but because the first word is also a mission statement. The first word is a, in real ways, a declaration of war. 
the Lord doesn't want Israel to just hunker down and privately worship him alone. They're meant to worship on behalf of the nations for the good of the nations. And the goal is that the nations will come to worship this one God. That's what we see in the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua is all about Israel's obedience and disobedience to the first word. And what does obedience in the book of Joshua look like? It looks like throwing down images of false gods, shattering shrines, overthrowing altars, and purging and purifying the land of idolatry. Jesus is the new Joshua who has come to destroy the works of the devil, to shatter idols and purge the world of all gods save his father. And he calls us to follow him, to follow him in that warfare. And just like Paul says, our battle is not against flesh and blood. We don't attack flesh with our own flesh. But we do make war against all false gods and idols and vanities until every idol is overthrown. The first word is a mission statement, not only for Israel, but for the church. And it's not only a word, it's a pledge, it's a promise. It states that the Lord is determined to have a world in which there are no other gods before his face. And he calls us to follow him and make war on idols, including our own, wherever they are. And he assures us that by the work of his son and the power of the spirit within us, that this warfare will be successful. There will come a day when there are no other gods before him. There will come a day when there is only one Lord and every knee will bow to him alone. Every tongue will confess to him alone that Jesus is Lord. Is the first word for us? Are the commandments for us? Absolutely. It challenges us to examine the idols of our own hearts. It challenges us to follow our king in his warfare against those idols. It challenges us to trust the God who will one day be free of all false gods and God himself will be all in all. Please pray with me. Holy and gracious God, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this word, this first word. And Lord, we pray that you would help us, Lord, to be a people who look to you alone as judge, who look to you alone as Savior, who look to you alone as lawgiver. Lord, the temptations to create other judges, the temptations to employ other saviors, the temptations to listen to other lawgivers is truly all around us. And I know some days we really feel it, other days maybe we don't feel it as much, but, but Lord, temptation abounds. And Lord, we long to be a people who join you in throwing down idols, in casting down crowns, and turning again, repenting from our idols and saying, you are the one true judge. You are the one God. There is no other. Lord, we pray that you would make us a people who worship on behalf of the nations and pray and beseech you to bring the nations into your church so that more and more the first word can become more and more of a reality. Lord, would you help us? Lord, would you have your way with us and form us into a people but who are content and free with you as judge, content and free with you as savior, content and free with you as lawgiver. Help us, we pray. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.